If you would turn with me in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 1. So, ooh, it smells like rain. Are they raining? Okay, Proverbs chapter 1. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to just do a slight review of last week. Last week, uh, was all we did really was the introduction to Proverbs. Um, kind of the, as Solomon gave us kind of the, the why he's writing Proverbs. And as we're going to continue on with the theme, we're going to see that it was written to instruct his son. It was written to instruct children, his children. And as I mentioned last week, to show us the heart of our Father, our Heavenly Father to us, and wanting us to succeed, wanting us to act wisely and be wise in this life. So in verse 2 of chapter 1 was to know wisdom and instruction, knowing uh, was attaining by seeking. Also in verse 2 part B there, second part, to perceive words of understanding. And perceive was interesting, is to be able to identify and divide words of understanding, wise words, which I thought was, was interesting, to be able to identify and divide. Verse 3, uh, to receive, to take the instruction of wisdom. Instruction also meaning warning or correction, reproof. So to be able to receive, to know instruction, perceive words of understanding, receive words of correction and wisdom. In verse 4, he, he mentioned to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. Basically, in Hebrew, meaning a plan. Knowledge and discretion would be to help a young man be able to look at life, look at what's going on, look at hopefully the Word of God, and make a plan of what to do. And that's a wise thing to have plans in life. It's a wise thing not to fly by the seat of our pants and go, well, I'll just figure it out what, when I get there. I used to think that in my younger days. And really, I was making provision for my flesh. Well, we'll just kind of see what happens when I get there. And then when I got there, oh, this happened. Whoops. You know, that kind of thing. Instead of making a plan and having a plan, which I really like that. So verse 4, having a plan, wise man. Not wise guy, wise man. Verse 5, Son, if you are wise, you will hear and learn a man of understanding who, who can discern from good and evil. So to discern, to separate, meaning to separate mentally, will attain wise counsel. Attain actually has the meaning of purchase, to own. You know, actually, the idea of paying a price to get wise counsel. Paying a price to be prudent. There's three P's in a row. Anyways. So continuing on, we're starting anew here in verse 8. Look at verse 8 with me, if you will. If you don't have a Bible, I forgot to say this. You can raise your hand, and one will be given to you. Everyone's got their... Oh, okay, here's one over here. John, if you would. Which, personally, I just like to read it. I like to see it for myself. Eyes on the Bible, right here. Proverbs verse 8, My son, hear the instruction of your father. Do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. Now, I read this last week, but basically what he's saying is, listen to our advice, son. Listen to your father and mother. Listen to our advice, because it's going to make you look good. I mean, that's really what he's saying. It's going to make you look good. It's going to make you look like you know what's going on when you're listening to your parents. It's going to have a crown and a necklace. Now, in saying, listen to my advice, it's going to make you look good, I got something to say. And that's kind of where he goes with this next part. Let me tell you something here. Verse 10, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. 
We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, back to the words of dad, my son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. For their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. Verse 17, surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, but they lie in wait for their own blood. They lurk secretly for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. Wow, boom. So here we have the story. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. This is basically the first time, I believe, documented where God says, and Solomon, basically, just say no. You ever heard that? Just say no. And this is it right here. Hey, if these guys are enticing you with this kind of thing, it seems obvious. You know, it seems obvious. They're, they're, they're saying, hey, let's plan to lie in wait to injure people. To kill them for no reason without cause. Let's, let's wait to hurt somebody, to kill them with, for no reason. And these guys are flying by the seat of their pants. Because the next line out of their mouth is a reason. So we can have money. So we can be rich. And then you can give us all your money, but it'll really be all of ours. Right? I, I don't know if you ever heard anything like that. That doesn't work out quite like the plan that they've given Hey, we're all going to go do this thing, and really, we're going to get all this money, and it'll be all of our money. And then you don't see them anymore, right? They're gone. Adios. What happened to my part? What? Who are you? <clears throat> so you kind of hear this. Obviously, it sounds a little far-fetched to us, but really what Solomon is saying, and the point of this is, hey, don't hang out with people who are doing ungodly things. Just say no. Don't associate. Don't hang out. Don't be friend. Don't go along with. Don't be a part of it. I'm not sure at this point if, if his son, maybe, the one that he's addressing this to, had already gone astray or not. But I mean, the question brings in my head, because I have, you know, I've had a few of these wisdom conversations when I was already getting into the trouble. Um, and that could be the problem, the, the, the issue here. I'm not sure. But this not hanging out with people who are doing ungodly things reminds me of a few other scriptures. The first one I'm just going to read. But remember last week, if you were here, I, I, was, I just kind of quoted some modern day proverbs. You know, if the shoe fits, I don't know. Uh, I've said a few of them. But um, the one that I said that this verse comes from, or the proverb comes from this verse, is bad company corrupts good morals. And it's 1 Corinthians 15. You might want to write it down. Verse 33. And Paul says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. Okay? You will be corrupted. You will be doing what they are doing. That's just a fact. You will be. I was talking to a young man three weeks ago. He goes, yeah. I said, how are you doing? Not very good. I'm like, well, well, what's going on? Well, I'm hanging out with a bunch of dumb guys. You know, they're idiots. I'm like, okay. You, I've identified your first problem. <laughs> but he, he goes, you know, I'm, I'm really not doing any of the bad stuff, but they ended up stealing their dad's truck, and then we all got arrested. And I'm like, okay. That's what happens, you know? And, and my words of wisdom to him was, if you want to see what you look like, look at your friends. That's what you look like. And that's what... King Solomon is saying, and I, and I pray, you know, I prayed, I, I, I tried to say, you know, I hope you don't have to hit the very rock bottom to turn around and come to God. But what he, his response to me was, well, people will think I'm dumb if I follow God again. And, it, and it's just, you know, it's the pressure. And I saw those, those pressures of the world on his life. And I've been praying for him. We need to continue to, you know, he's not listening to wisdom. He's not listening to sound advice. The second verse, the second scripture that it reminds me of that I want you guys to turn to is 2 Corinthians chapter 6. If you would flip over there, it's kind of a longer section we're going to go through. And I am kind of, for the sake of time, 
It's going through this a little bit speedily. That's not no problem, Rachel. You did a great job. We're proud of you. That was excellent. And maybe you could come visit sometime. <laughs> that magical land of our earth. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. You guys there? <laughs> All right, here we go. I'm sorry, I said verse 13. Verse 14, correction. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And then here's a list of rhetorical questions. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? It doesn't, right? What communion has light with darkness? It can't. And, and what accord has Christ with Belial, or Satan? He doesn't have accord with them. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Here's Paul, he's getting to the point. What part do you have with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. He's going to go on to another section, but I had to stop for a second. And just look at this, this in, um, in verse 16. What, ag what agreement has a temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. The people that we hang around with, whether they know it or not, or whether we know it or not, are going to bring with them into our lives whatever it is they worship. They're going to bring it in. Right into your life. And guess what? They are worshiping something. People are, are worshiping something. They're giving more time and energy to something in their life that they're worshiping. These are things that they they're called idols because they're worshiping, worshiping them in place of God. In this case, we see in the story that Solomon laid out for us, we see greed at the end right there, that section we read in verse 19. We also see um, power. You know, there's power in that hurting other people and murder. In other cases, we see drugs, alcohol, sex, self-pleasure, self, right? Self, yourself can be your God, worshiping yourself. And money, mammon. There's a, there's a whole bunch of them. But the fact of the matter is, whoever's coming into our lives, they're going to be bringing in those things into our life. And God knows that, Right? That's what this scripture and a large majority of the Old Testament is about. He told the children of Israel over and over not to marry women from the other nations, not to, not to allow them to bring idols into their house, because, not because he's racist or hates other nations or other people, but because he loves his people. Because he loves his people. He's telling us not to be an equally yoke, not because he hates other people or doesn't like other kinds of people, it's because he loves you. It's because he wants the best for you. He doesn't want okay for you. He loves you. He wants the best for you. He knows that if they're moving into our lives, then their idols and their pagan ways are coming right in the front door with them. It's funny, I read about this very thing this morning in Jeremiah. And there was a verse kind of about this, talking about after they had already started worshiping idols. And it was very interesting to me. If you want to turn there, it's Jeremiah chapter 16. If you don't want to flip around, that's fine too. Jeremiah chapter 16, <coughs> starting in verse 10. Just an interesting thing. And it kind of goes along with the study, but it's just kind of interesting to me. It says in verse 10, you know, Jeremiah, you know, Jeremiah's the weeping prophet. He, he's, he's sad and, he, and he's distraught over all the things that God is going to do to the children of Israel because they won't turn from their ungodliness, really. And so, in verse 10 it says, and, and, he, and, and it shall be with you, I'm sorry, let me start over. And it shall be when you show this people all these words, and they say to you, why has the Lord pronounced this great disaster on us? 
Or what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we've committed against the Lord our God? And then you shall say to him, Because your fathers have forsaken me, says the Lord. Stop there for a second. Because your fathers have forsaken me. And it kind of, you kind of stop and say, Well, you're pronouncing punishment upon these people because of their parents, because of the way that their fathers have worshipped, forsaken the Lord their God. And what does it say right there in the, in the second part of 11? It says, They walked after other gods and have served them and worshipped them and forsaken me and have not kept my law. So all of this walking after ungodly things and doing these ungodly things leads to really why they're being judged. And this is what he says in the next section. Why these people are it's not your parents, but them doing that has led to this in verse 12. You have done worse than your fathers. For behold... Each follows the dictates of his own evil heart so that no one listens to me. Boom. The first thing I thought of was our country. As, as we've been bringing ungodliness and false idols into our lives, and our children just go, hey, you know, and I'm not speaking of your guys' children, but a lot of the children in this nation go, hey, I do whatever feels right for me, and that's cool for me. And you do whatever's cool for you, and that's cool for you. And we're all good. And that's exactly what the Scripture's talking about there in Jeremiah. My devotion this morning. That they're doing whatever they want. They're following their own dictates of their heart. And then guess what? Flip over, maybe it's one page, maybe it's on the same page. Jeremiah 17, starting in verse 9. God says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Whoa. They're doing whatever their heart desires. God says they don't even know that their hearts are so dirty, filthy, ugly, sinful before me. And they're going to get what they've been reaping. What they've been reaping, what they've been sowing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Scary. Scary, right? So here in Jeremiah, we have a clash of the worldly wisdom versus the godly wisdom. And I'm basically standing here to tell you that whatever we get from God is better than whatever we get from man, be it wisdom, honor, blessings, anything in this life is better to receive from God than from man. Anytime. Any day of the week. So, I don't know if you were keeping thumbs or fingers in other scriptures, but back to 2 Corinthians. If you weren't, I apologize. I meant to tell you to keep your finger in the other page. I didn't. It misled you down a slippery road. Not really. Okay, so back to, I believe it's verse 16 in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Is that what you were? So back to verse 16. Going back to it. Now, God is saying, hey, remember, remember the context where we're talking about. The last thing he said was, hey, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And, and God has said, verse 16, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, basically in the context of being unequally yoked. And I will receive you. Now that's an important thing. I know in my life it's important that God receives me. And I know that it should be in all of our lives. That's important. I want God to receive me, especially when the day comes. Especially when the day comes. In verse 18, he says, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. I want that. Says the Lord God Almighty. I want that. That is sweet. It's funny because as we go through Proverbs, I keep thinking, that is sweetness. That I want that. I want that in my life. From last week, I accept that challenge. I accept that challenge to forsake those ungodly things in my life, those ungodly relationships in my life, because I want to be your child. I want to be known as that. Who's Isaac? He's nobody, but he's a child of the king. That's what I want. That's what I want. I don't want to have my list of 
things follow my, la my name. I just want to say, child of the king. Mm -hmm. Okay, now go back. you got your other thumb in Proverbs. Flip back to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 15. <coughs> We've looked at what, that whole section about not being with the ungodly. Not keeping with them. Not going down their foolish paths. My son, verse 15, do not walk in the way with them. <coughs> I kind of like, though, how at the very end of that last section we read, you shall be my sons and daughters, and then we go right into verse 15, my son. Ha, huh, back to me. Oh, God's son, praise you, Lord. Do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path, where their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. Again, that pleading, that heart of the Father. Verse 17. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. But they lie in wait for their own blood. They lurk secretly for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. Interesting. Verse 19 is this, it's a solid fact. If you've seen those or heard that country song, I don't even know which one I'm talking about, but I think there's a lot of them that talk about a guy working to the bone and then looking back at his life and realizing he didn't spend time with his kids, he didn't spend time with his wife. And what did I live for? I lived for a dream that was fading. So, so, so much fat. You got the name of it, John? Oh, he looked at me like, I know that song. <coughs> <laughs> but that happens in life. I mean, years ago, I look back and the story of the businessman or the guy that works in the big old tower. He's soup and he realizes that his whole life is going to And he's been blowing it. Okay, but let's go back to verse 17. Let's check it out for a second now. He says, Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. So he, he basically is saying, Son, these people that you're wanting to hang out with that are doing these evil things, they're dumber than a bird. Okay? Even birds can see when a net is being set, and they avoid it. But these guys are out setting their own net for destruction, and they can't see it. In the words of John Corson, don't be a bird brain. Now, I, ha I just had to do this, okay? In, pro in uh, Job, we're going through, we're still going through the creation. We've been going through it on Sunday mornings for like three weeks. We're going through how amazing God's design and creation is. It's at the end of the chapter when, Job, when Job's kind of there with his buddies that have been giving him horrible advice and that. And then God shows up in the whirlwind and he says, Job, where were you when I put the foundations of the world in place? Job like, oh, you know, I guess I don't know I mean, all the things that I thought that I, yeah, I wasn't here, God, you know, that kind of thing, but just like we would. But we're, we're learning about, about creation, and, and we're, we're right at the verge. Next time we meet together, we're going to learn about the ostrich. It is actually listed in there, and it is a bird, believe it or not. But here's some interesting facts. I'm going to put on an ostrich, bird brain ostrich. Okay. First of all, interesting fact. The ostrich is the biggest bird. The male can be six to nine feet tall. Okay? Nine feet tall. That means when I look at it, right? Pretty tall. Big bird. They can run 45 miles an hour. They're fast. Striding with those legs 10 to 16 feet in a single stride. Wow. I used to run like that in high school. <laughs> so, maybe I look like an ostrich. My arms are too small. That joke. They can run, listen, listen to this one. They can run for 30 miles an hour for half an hour for half an hour. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. 
They lay eggs that are three pounds and six inches across. One ostrich egg has as much egg in it as two dozen chicken eggs. Uh, yeah, that's an omelet. <laughs> Mice think it's food. <laughs> Another fact that I wasn't going to mention, ostrich farms are all over the world and they raise them for food. I've never eaten an ostrich, but I've heard that a medium like rare chicken. ostrich is off the hook. I don't know. I mean, it's good for those of you that don't. Okay, another interesting fact. An ostrich has eyes, the largest eyes of any land animal. Any land animal. Eyes are two inches across. They're about the size of a billiard ball. The eyeballs. Another interesting fact. David Holmes is appreciating that. Another interesting fact. <laughs> Another interesting fact, their brain is smaller than one eyeball. Their brain is smaller than one of their eyeballs. And because their brain is smaller than one of their eyeballs, when they are running 30 miles an hour for 30 minutes from a predator for long periods of time, they often forget why they were running, but continue to do so and then end up getting lost. This is a fact. This is a fact. Absolutely a fact. Okay, ostriches also, they really don't stick their heads in the sand, but if there is a predator or they do become alarmed, they will stick their head in a bush to hide from the predator. <laughs> that is also a fact. So basically, I like what John Corson said, do not be a bird brain. Hey, he's saying, hey, this is easy. It's really a no-brainer. It's really an easy one. Don't hang out with them. Don't go in that direction. You don't have to be. But, you know, I really liked that whole, going back to that whole verse that talks about the young men planning out their life. Planning out uh, what they're going to do. Not just floating around. Because a lot of times you don't see the end result. And this, in his wisdom, King Solomon is saying, look, the end's going to be bad. The beginning, there might be some kind of joy in that sin. I don't know, but the end's going to be bad. And that's wisdom that a lot of, especially young people, don't look towards. What's going to happen? What's the consequence of this? I don't know. It's going to be fun right now. I mean, that's a lot of the attitude. I remember in high school some of the attitude that, that happened. And some of the consequences that follows. So next, <clears throat> Solomon goes on. And this next small section, as we wrap it up this evening, he goes on to say, uh, to personify wisdom, as he's calling, um, as, as wisdom is a woman calling in the streets. We know that if we really want a more accurate view of wisdom, there is a person to look at besides the woman. In Colossians chapter 2, there's a section of scripture, and it ends up saying both of the Father and Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you know me, you know, because I'm from heaven. I'm from above, right? I'm from the Father. I have the words of the Father. The things that I do, I don't do them because I want to do them. I do them because it's the will of... Especially we see that in the cross. Especially that comes to light on the cross. As we see God, God, the Son, Jesus in the garden, saying, there's any other way. But he obeys to the point of death. So we know that when we look at Jesus, we're seeing a very accurate picture of the Father. Because even his disciples said, well, show us the Father, it'll be enough. And he's like, have I been with you this whole time? Have you seen what I've done? Maybe he didn't have the attitude that I'm having. I'm sorry. But I, if I was there, have you been with me this whole time? Have you not seen what I've done? Have you not seen who I am? Hey, that's the fact. That Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So if we're going to make wisdom a person, let's make him Jesus, because that's the truth. Amen. Verse 20. Wisdom calls aloud 
outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses. At the openings of the gate in the city, she speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Solomon is kind of saying here, wisdom's out in the street, in the gates. She's there. She's crying. You just have to listen. You have to look. And it, and it, it makes me, if, when I first read this section, the first thing I thought, this is what I want to share with you now, but it made me stop and think, well, in King Solomon's day, in his day and age in Israel, right after David's uh, running of Israel, just the name Israel means governed by God, right? The name Israel means governed by God. So I'm thinking, his day and age, he's living in a nation. The whole, the whole idea of the nation is a nation is governed by God. Right? And for at least a while, they honored God in that nation. So you could go into the courtyard, and there probably would be some wise, godly man there in the courtyard. That was a place of meeting. That was a place where wise men would sit around and philosophicize or whatever they did. And they talk about God and they and they talk about life and the clouds and I'll talk I like talking about the clouds. I don't know if I've talked to you about them, but I'll do that later. Okay. So here here we have a place, here we have a a nation, here we have a city that God is in. And, and I, 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 I can't help but stop, think, and stop, and just think, God, this is not what America's like. This is not what where I live is like. You don't walk out into the parking lot of Walmart and hear somebody proclaiming the wisdom of God, proclaiming the truths of God. You don't go into the courtrooms and hear as much anymore. Amen. In fact, they're taking things out. And I'm thinking about this. I know when our, when our nation was founded, there was a whole lot of God. There was a whole lot of revolving around God. And I, I pray for that to come back. I don't know the exact future, but I do know the end of the book, which gives me great hope. But listen, in modern days, I don't see that. I see much more self and greed being projected, just like the end of that first section we talked about. Like in verse 19. But if you're thinking, man, I think I'm a little hopeless right now. You're telling me the nation that it used to be and all these things. I would say, wait a second, lift up your head. There's hope. There's still a place where people can learn godly wisdom. Where people are praying for one another, loving one another. Where the word of God can be heard and, and can be spoken. Where the word of God is changing lives. It's the church. The church is here. The church is still in our nation. There still is hope. Because God is in, He dwells in His people. You are the temple of God. As we just read. I think sometimes we forget how important it is to be in fellowship with the body of Christ. To be hearing the word of God spoken. But I have to stop and say thank you, God, for your remnant of people in the United States that believe in you, that trust in you, that will gather together, that will encourage one another, lift each other up, that will hear sound teaching, that will hear your wisdom and not forsake it, but want it in their lives. Want it in their lives. Verse 23, turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. I take verse 23 as literally from God. As he is saying, repent. Repent. Turn. At the words of truth. Turn at them. And guess what's going to happen? I will pour out my spirit upon you. And I will make my words known to you. Praise God. That's what we need. That is what we need. (coughs) 
Let's keep going on. Verse 24. We need to, I was going to say something else. We need to wrap up. Verse 24. We do, we do want His words. They're known to us. We do want His Spirit upon us. So let's listen to His correction, review, and let's turn. In verse 24, but because, I put a but in there, but because I have called, and you refused, I stretched out my hand, and no one regarded, because you disdained all my counsel, and would have none of my rebuke. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. Now, I just want to make clear, this is Solomon speaking of wisdom, not saying that God is going to laugh at you when terror comes in your life. Verse 27, when your terror comes like a storm and destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distresses, when distress and anguish come upon you, verse 28, then they will call on me. So when it gets too hard for them to bear, when it's so difficult because of their own decisions, then they'll call on wisdom. Then they'll call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek diligently, but will not find me. I have to stop for a second. That part reminds me so much of basically the, the scene in hell. <laughs> right? And, and how can I say that? If you remember that rich man that went to heaven. I mean, went to, heaven, went to hell, right? And the, and the beggar, Lazarus, I believe, was over in heaven. Or Abraham's bosom. We see this whole scene going on where, where you would think, here, here's a place where a time when those that are not in heaven are thinking of all the opportunities they had to follow sound wisdom and they didn't do it. And, and man, I don't want to be there. I don't want anyone else to be there. I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm saying we need to, Lord help us. We need to share the gospel. We need people to know the truth. We need to be living that truth. So that they see the truth in us, not just hear about it. But verse 29, to me, is another key verse. It's the flip-flop of back over, I think, at verse 7. Remember we talked about the beginning of knowledge and what it was in that? Verse 29 is a flip-flop. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. They're basically hating everything that God's telling them. They're basically hating everything that is the truth. They're running from it, turning from it. Verse 30, they would have none of my counsel and despise my every rebuke. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. For the turning away of the simple will slay them. Complacency of fools will destroy them. And then here's a good but. Mine was just thrown in there. Verse 33, but whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. That's another one of those verses where I go, I want that. I want that in my life. I don't want to have question marks. I don't, I don't want to say what if. I want to dwell safely. I'm following the wisdom of God. And that should be our heart. Let's all stand together. I'll have uh, Caleb come in and share a song with us. But here, but here it is, you know, in this beginning opening set, this opening section, as we see God's heart to warn us, to warn us, to want the best for his kids. But always giving us that choice. Choice is really ours, man. We, we need to follow. We need to listen to what he's saying. Because we will reap what we sow. Those who sow to the flesh, destruction, but those who sow to the spirit, everlasting life. Amen. So, God, we come before you tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the faithfulness of just you, your nature. You are the faithful one. God, you provided, you haven't left us alone, you provided your word to lead and guide us. I pray that you make us, help make us wise. As we dig into the Proverbs, that we would just hold on to these things. Because those times that we haven't been wise, it's hurt. But it's a good hurt, Lord, as we learn from it. We grow. And I just thank you 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. For the but whoever listens. Lord, we want to be one of those. God, work in our lives, Lord. Meet us here. Be with us. We need you. We want you, God. We want you, Lord. <laughs>